this is a world premiere for for Dutton Oxford. Um, but any any feedback at the end would be I'd be grateful for. And, and if anyone could start a timer away for me, that'd be good too. I, I think it's about an hour, but too, I'll start with myself. But uh, let's let's hope. Yeah, there we go. Right, my contact details are down at the bottom. The unlikely event that anyone ever wants to talk to me. But uh, so I've been like uh, like Dan said, I've been talking functional programming for an awfully long time. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to, to keep things moving by setting myself uh, a project. So I converted an old 1970s basic game into, into functional C-sharp. And I'll give, uh, so this isn't gonna be an entirely useful talk, but I'm hoping it might at least be fun. And it combines a couple of my obsessions, that being history and um, old computer games because I, I probably spend more time playing those than I really like to admit to. So let's go on. Oh, there we go. Uh, and sorry, th there we go, food. I, I was kicking myself for not finding somewhere else to put it in, but I can't uh, break with tradition. This is one of my favourite curries of all time. This is a vindaloo from Goa, which does not taste anything like the vindaloos in the UK. They're, they're kind of vinegary. They're done with red vinegar, red wine vinegar. They're delicious and not necessarily hot. So if you ever get to Goa, make sure to try one out. But there you go. Dan, I hope you're happy. Food. Um, <laughs> and that's a goat curry, by the way. Goat curries are the best. Anyway. <laughs> right. What is functional programming in brief? It's paradigm, not framework, uh, meaning it's a style of programming. And if anyone can see the piano there behind me, um, you can play many styles of music on the piano. Similarly, given a programming language like C sharp, you can write in many, uh, in many styles of programming. Um, and functional is one, object orientated is another. Uh, it is declarative, not imperative. Uh, that is, those are categories of paradigm. Imperative is more concerned with how I achieve a goal. How precisely should the compiler move from place to place through the code? How precisely should this object be built up and in what order should everything be done? Declarative is less concerned with that and more concerned with the what do you want rather than how do you do it? Uh, a good example and the most common example that most people are aware of of declarative is SQL. SQL is declarative. Because when you write an SQL statement, do you really care what order the lines are executed in? You don't. And they are not executed in the order that you write them. Chances are, in most cases, the select is about the last thing that's executed, but the first that you write. So we're less concerned with the order of operations. What are the properties of functional? Immutability, meaning once you have set a variable, you can't change it again. Higher order functions, meaning functions passed around as variables, either often as the return from a function or the parameter into a function. Expressions rather than statements, an uh, statement is things like uh, anything that might break the order of execution. So a where, um, a for, a for each, an if, don't typically have those in a functional language. We use expressions being like lambdas or whatever. Referential transparency, which is a scary term for something that's fairly simple, meaning when you write a function, it shouldn't really rely on anything other than its own parameters and have no side effects. So given the same input, so the same parameters, you always get the same output. Recursion, hoping everyone's okay with recursion. Shout out now if you're not, gonna to be tough for you otherwise. Uh, pattern matching, this is a feature of C Sharp. As of about C Sharp 8, we've got this and it's just getting better and better with every version of C Sharp that comes. And it's, it's stateless. There is no real concept of state as such. If you've ever dealt with React and Redux, then Redux is a perfect example of how we do state in, uh, in functional. You, you can have write functions which take the old state and an, uh, an instruction and then return a new object containing the new version of the state. So that's roughly what functional programming is. But why? Why do we want to do it? Well, these are my reasons anyway. Reduce code noise. I'm a lazy developer, and I don't mean I sit around doing nothing. What I mean is I am too lazy to write all the boilerplate that object-orientated code forces you to write. I want to achieve the same result with as little effort as possible. Plus, it's easy to read because there's less noise getting in the way of understanding the code, which makes it easier to just pick up and work with. Um, it's more testable because it's more predictable, it has fewer side effects and consequences, so it's easier to write unit tests. It's more robust, so if you want code which you want to be able to stand up and stay running forever, then this is great. 
more predictable and it's better support for concurrency. So if you're interested in stuff like um, uh, Azure Functions or um, stuff like that, you know, stuff where you want to stand up multiple instances of the same processor side by side, this tends to support it well because stateless tends to have less resource contention, that sort of thing. As I sit in brief, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, ooh, somebody's cooking something. Darn it, they've got me back. This is Dan's revenge. <laughs> Um, anyway, moving on. Another note as well. There are two parts of a shadow. And similarly, with functional programming, with C Sharp, you can't do everything. You cannot write purely functional code in C Sharp. Uh, the two parts of a shadow here is the, this is the umbra, the darkest part of the shadow. <laughs> Using PG, I think so. I don't know what it is, but it smells good. Uh, and the, the sort of the vague bit around the edge, the pen umbra. So as a C-sharp functional programmer, my goal is to maximize the most the purely functional side of the, uh, of the language, of my code, and to minimize the, the bits where I've had to compromise, because inevitably there will be compromises you have to make. It's the way it is. Um, but keep that as small as possible, wrap it away. And I'll make, I'll make some comments on this, but uh, this isn't going to be a, pro, a talk about the whole of the paradigm. I'm just going to have a bit of fun and touch on a few interesting ideas. There are other talks available, books available for those that want to go deeper into functional. So Oregon, going to be honest, never really heard of it before this, uh, before I started this project. Yes, it's a state of America, but I couldn't have told you where it is. Well, there it is. There you go. It's up there, just below Washington and just above California. What's it famous for? I had to look this up because I've never heard of it. Beautiful scenery, apparently. And I have to admit, that's pretty nice. If anybody happens to run a, 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 you know, a, a, a conference uh, in, in Oregon and you'd like for me to come and you'll pay my expenses, then you know, feel free, just saying. Uh, I'd like to see these places. But uh, <laughs> that's probably wishful thinking. Uh, the company Nike turns out they're from Oregon. Who knew? There you go. Named incidentally after the Greek goddess of victory, hence the, 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 the funny name. There you go. They're from Oregon. And uh, does anybody remember the 1980s film The Goonies? I certainly do. Yeah, The Goonies. Uh, so named because they're from the Goon Docks area of their city, which apparently is in Oregon. Okay, there you go. You now know three things, which is more than I did about a week ago. Uh, and... Um, the Oregon Trail, the legend of the Oregon Trail, which is, uh, I believe, an important part of American history, but of course wasn't taught in, in, in school when I when I attended. But there you go. Um, what it, the Oregon Trail was set up by a whole load of folks moving from one side of America to the other in these these covered wagons. There you go. That's the map moving from um, the uh, the Missouri River through the great big desert in the middle of the U.S. Uh, over the Blue Mountains and then finally down into, into Oregon. Um, and that's that's kind of that's the the topic of this this particular game. Uh, a couple of other features which will be relevant to the game once we get around to it is the the South Pass, which is this is the only picture I can find of it. But apparently there is a low part of the mountains where you can pass relatively safely, and this is where the route took you through. Uh, there are forts dotted along the uh, along the route where uh, you can make trading uh, make trades with. Uh, with folks for, for more supplies, that sort of thing. And there's a few other features too, but uh, that's that's roughly what's, what the Oregon bit is. And then I have to move the story on about a hundred years or so to, oh, come on, this guy, his name is, oh dear. Sorry, sorry, my notes are flying all over the place. There we go, where is it? I keep forgetting his flipping name. And it is, ah. Kemney. There we go. John Kemney. Right. Thank you. Uh, he's a Hungarian mathematician, an absolute legend, apparently, in the field. He was uh, a human calculator, a human computer for um, uh, Richard Feynman. He worked with Alonzo Church, who I'm not sure if anyone's heard of, but he, uh, oh, Sasquatches, really? Is that, is that Oregon? Sasquatches. Um, he worked with Alonzo Church, who was a, a big deal in the functional business because he set an awful lot of the groundwork for um for what became functional programming back in the 50s and uh, i don't know if anyone's heard the uh, the old cliche that einstein was not very good at maths well this is the guy that said it he was a research assistant for einstein but where it becomes more important to me is uh, that he became the head of the maths department at dartmouth university in, in the one in america and um 
achieved two incredible things when it came to computing. And it all came about because he got fed up of the way that the computers worked. What they had at Dartmouth was a gigantic, um, uh, gigantic single computer down in the basement. And what you had to do was hand in a punch card to whoever it was that operated the thing and then come back in one or two weeks to, to find out what had happened because what the chat would do would be bundle everyone's punch cards together and then feed them through all in one big go, uh, a batch operation. This is actually where the term batch operation comes from, it's from that process with the, with the computers. And he actually had a bit of an obsession though with computers. He thought they were the absolute way forward, but he wanted them to be accessible to everybody. So, he time there we go. He turned up with one of his colleagues, chap. Oh, for goodness' sake, uh, a chap called Kurtz. There, I was, was it, sorry, not very good with names. It was uh, Kurtz, Kurtz, Kurtz. Thomas Kurtz. There we go. Sorry, terrible names. Thomas Kurtz, and together they they developed two things, which were two of the greatest computing revolutions of that period. So one was called time sharing. Uh, they implemented it in Dartmouth. And the idea was that you'd have your mainframe down in the basement, a single mainframe for your campus, and it would time share between terminals dotted around the place. And so everyone could sit at a terminal and appear to be using a separate computer. But actually what the, the mainframe was doing was flicking from place to place constantly, switching its attention. So it meant that everyone could go and actually use the thing and it would appear vaguely to be live. And the other was he wanted to work on a programming language that everyone could use because previously what we were looking at is things like COBOL and Fortran, which I don't know, I've never really learned them, but whatever I've seen them, they're not terribly user-friendly. So he wanted to create... Oops, was that somebody? Um, no, okay. Uh, but he developed a programming language which was based on looking friendly and looking relatively easy to read. One where you would start every single command with a verb, so it would be obvious what on earth you were doing. And there it is. The uh, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code, or BASIC, for short. Now, anyone think, uh, oh, COBOL found whaling, could be. Never really worked in COBOL, but uh, I believe it's a, it's a recipe for retiring rich and happy if you, if you know it and can work with the systems that still use it. But um, uh, incidentally, if anyone thinks that this particular bit of code is a good idea, it's not, because amongst its other strange features was that instead of structured loops in basic, you literally did go-tos to go to the line that you wanted. And that's how you implemented loops. It was a recipe for disaster if you weren't incredibly careful. But the point was that it was very verbose, very easy to read, and pretty much anyone could pick it up. And he also um, spearheaded another command, which believe it or not was controversial at the time, but changed the way that function that programs worked. Input. It seems strange now, but actually there were people who thought this was craziness to have a command like input, which stops the program executing midway and waits for the user. A lot of folks uh, thought this was madness, but he included it in basic. And of course, this meant that everyone went away and developed games, which is brilliant for the rest of us. Apparently, Dartmouth University that year was just absolutely crammed with everyone's game that they'd come up with, including things like uh, computer game simulations of American football and stuff like that. But moving forward a few years when this was started, this, uh, this idea of the timeshare and, and basic started spreading around to the rest of the universities of America. This was one that was used in the early 70s. Uh, this is HP timeshare basic that this thing runs on. Now notice it has no screen, it doesn't. It's literally a printer and a keyboard. So you would type in your command, press enter or whatever, and then the computer would think for a bit and then it would literally type the output onto the, onto the roll of paper there. And that is how you interacted with it. Um, and it was in a university in America that these three gentlemen came up with the idea that they would make the lesson they were teaching on the Oregon Trail a little more exciting by creating a computer game simulation of it. This is in 1971. 
And that's exactly what they did. And it became the absolute hit on campus that year. The thing was saved to the mainframe and half the campus were playing the thing. Now, at the end of the semester, it was actually wiped. So the 1971 version of Oregon Trail is lost to history. But in 1975, they were approached by a Minnesota um, educational company who published games for educational purposes to recreate their game and sell it. And that was the 1975 version. And that still exists to this day. This is what it looked like. Don't it look thrilling? It was an entirely text-based um, uh, game. And this is all the, this is the setup. So you'd, uh, you'd have various options. You have how much do you want to spend on things? You'd have uh, options presented to you periodically for what you wanted to do. Uh, there was a mini game. There's actually a hunting mini game in it where you could, you could shoot. Uh, the object was to type bang as quickly as you can. And how many seconds you took to type bang determined how good your shot was, or if you even typed it correctly. So it was pretty crude in appearance compared to what we could do now but considering this was written effectively in 1971 and it is surprisingly complex some of the logic that operates behind so honestly i'm actually rather impressed by it even if you know we could do a lot better now but you know in its day it was an impressive piece of work this is roughly what a turn of the game looks like you've got a setup phase actually why am i using my hand when i've got a, got a mouse there we go we've got a setup phase here with, uh, with your initial purchases, you've got $700 at the beginning of the game and you can spread it around as you want. Begin the turn and then you've got a series of cho choices. Do you want to go hunting or trade? And then after that, there are a series of random encounters. First is, are there some riders on the feet on the uh, road ahead? A whole batch of random events. There's, uh, I've missed it off, but there's also eating and uh, mountains, which it has a system for determining, are you in the mountains yet? Based on a, a fairly complex um, uh, bit of mathematics uh, and a probability curve. And then finally, a decision based on, are we there yet? Yes or no? And to loop back to the beginning to a new term or go to the ending. And of course, that goes without saying, it's also possible for you to die at various points of this. Uh, so that's it. That's roughly what the code looked like. Now I've put some coloring in here so that um, it's a little easier to read. Now, if anyone's ever done basic in its more modern forms like VB or VB.net, some of these commands might look familiar. We've got a dim statement here for creating arrays, uh, which actually in this case is actually a string. Um, we've got ifs and thens. Now, rem is an interesting one because like I said, part of the, part of the principles behind the design of basic was everything starts with a verb. And as such, even, um, Comments start with verbs, so remark statements. That's a comment. There you go. There are no, there are no funny little bits of C syntax in this thing. And back in 1975, when it said print, it meant it. You print that on a printer. It's uh, hardcore that way. And thankfully for me, because for some reason in basic, uh, variables were always given literally letter, that tiny little absolutely unhelpful names like this, they did stick a load of REM statements at the end to actually help me decode what the rest of the thing means. I'm not sure what the, I don't know if that was a memory saving thing or what, but this, this is how these things tend to be. So the first thing I want to deal with is one of the trickier for, um, uh, for functional programming, that's deal with interactions with the user, because uh, functional code is based on the idea of no side effects and pure functions and nothing more important than a human being. And other, look how happy he is. He's happy because he's playing Oregon Trail, damn it. That's how good this game is. So this is it as it would be uh, under normal circumstances, literally the player interacts with the window, which goes straight into the game, you know, via a, a console object. Now I want amongst my goals here is not only to be functional, but also incredibly testable because I'm a nice person. So first off, Let's stick a, a console interface in there so we can obscure away the console behind an interface. But it's not actually functional yet. We'd still be doing direct uh, calls. So I use a functional concept. Uh, concept. It's called um, it's called a maybe. In fact, a maybe is an object which can come back in three forms: something, nothing. And I also put error in there because I like to capture errors. I'm, I'm actually sure if it's even possible to get errors back off the console. I suppose it must be. But uh, you know, just in case, I'm going to capture that. That's what the maybe looks like. 
So start with an abstract class here, which you have to inherit off and then inherit it three times. Nothing, something, an error. The nothing means the user just pressed enter and uh, didn't enter anything. That's kind of an error case. The something means that uh, they actually entered something and here it is. And then the error means that there was an error and I've captured it. Uh, this technique incidentally is called a discriminated union. Uh, C sharp can't really do it the way that F sharp can. We can literally just glue a whole load of types together into sort of a multi state um, uh, structure. Uh, so I'm simulating it with an abstract class with inheritance down at the bottom. This is also a very, very crude version of a monad, but I'm not going to dwell too much on that side of things. But the point is, I could do something like this. I can do my read line now. Or I'm going to read into this and I'm going to have my return type as maybe to say that a string is coming out of this, but I'm not actually sure if there really is a string or not. But I'm going to give you the information based on the return type that will let you determine for yourself what it was and what to do. And here I'm going to actually do a normal console read line now. This is actually going to be a call to an interface, really. Check against null or white space. And if it is null or white space, return nothing to say that they didn't enter anything. If there was a, actually some text, then let's pop it into a something. And if there's an error, we'll turn into an error. So this captures all possible states out of the console. But, and then here's how I'd actually receive it on the other side. I'd use uh, some pattern matching to say something, nothing or error. And there you go. So based on what happened, I can do the appropriate thing uh, in reaction to it, easy peasy. And this is what I'd use, by the way, for write lines. I've called it operation. I'm not quite sure what else to call it. But basically the same concept of the, some, the maybe, except there's no actual return type because a write line simply is, 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 a, is, a, uh, is a void. So this is just to capture whether an error happened or not. And I could also extend that by uh, attaching uh, an extension method to absolutely everything and then do a try catch, just like attach um, whatever this is and feed it into an action. And then there we go. I can run it safely with a try catch wherever it happens to be without having to literally throw up a try catch around every single operation because this is far too much boilerplate for me and I'm too lazy for that. And there you go. That's my right line. So params because everyone should use params more because it's awesome. Um, so start with a message try operation and inside that bit of for each. So if at any point this errors, then this operation will return as an error. Otherwise it'll return as a success. So again, I can do a, a catch on the other pattern match on the other side to say, based on that, what do I actually do? Although probably I'd mostly just not do much because if this was a right line to a console. But I can take this concept a little step further because inside Oregon Trail, there's two kinds of data that I want back from the user. And usually I want to be specific about which it is that I'm receiving, because most of the time I want an integer to be from the console input. And by using these sorts of concepts, what I'm doing is putting the onus on the function which is providing the data to sort it out into what it is and take that away from the multiple places it's consumed. So rather than having to check in every single instance of a call to this, whether it was valid, whether it was good, whether it was the form I wanted. Instead, I'll let the function itself describe automatically what came out of it in, in, what, in by uh, returning one of these states. So error and nothing can, they can stay as they are because that's just like an empty input or whatever. But I'm going to split something into text and integer because sometimes I specifically want text and other times I specifically want integer. And I can actually store those as states, again, using inheritance. And that's actually what I'll supply to the, the game engine. So what I'm doing here is I'm gradually shifting from the, the outside impure world, stage by stage, into something pure and meaningful to the turn engine. Because the turn engine here, the thing that's sort of doing uh, running the, the engine behind the game, it doesn't really care um, what's happening on the console. All it wants to know is, I got something back, it was text or an integer. So I am representing it here in this structure, which looks kind of like this. Again, same basic idea, start with an abstract, inherit off it many times, depending on what each of our states are. And then I can do some pattern matching to decide what to do as a result. So uh, something like this. This is, a, this is how my get input looks. So I'm gonna do a, this get input here is taking a prompt 
from the game, writing it to the user and then asking for a result back. So first off a write result, um, coming back from console write line, switching on that to say, was it a failure or not? If it was a failure, I'll just uh, make my read results um, an error to go back to the user there. Or alternatively, it wasn't, so I'll do a read line. So I wouldn't bother to do the read line if, uh, if, um, if there was an error. I don't even know if that's a thing that can happen with the console again. And based on that, I'll decide, was it, um, I'll do a try parse here. So what I'm saying is, given that it was a something, that is some actual text was entered, try parse it. And if it came back as an integer, then I will return a new integer input object and then do the parsing, which safe in the knowledge that it is in fact an integer. Otherwise, I'll assume that it was a something, meaning it was just text, so I'll return a text input. Otherwise, it was an error or it was an empty. And there we go. So it means I've given my game something very meaningful and I've taken an awful lot of boiler code away. And that's what the, the beginning of this looks like. This is the bit where it's asking, uh, it's asking whether you want some instructions. And in fact, based on the original um, basic code, um, literally, if you say, yes, I do, otherwise any other input says no, which is exactly what this is doing. So I'm doing a user input, get input, this will be a, um, an input type containing many subtypes. And I'm saying if it's a text input and the two upper of it, so it's case insensitive, is yes, true, otherwise false. So in a simple little bit of text, I've that has captured all the possible error states and everything. All the, uh, any other variation of what the user could do is captured inside that. And, but there's only one case I'm actually interested in to return true. So it's nice and easy and simple. Uh, I could, I have many places around the game as well where there are conditional statements for um, for writing blocks of text based on, so like this, that's an if. I'm not too uncomfortable with leaving an if statement in place where there's just a single thing underneath it that's kind of vaguely still following the functional paradigm. If you start putting lots of stuff under this if, and especially if you then start putting further ifs and other structures, you then you've veered away from the functional paradigm and uh, you're doing something a bit different. So although I'm not too bothered about leaving this in place, I just thought I'd make it a little more functional by writing this guy. So this is a write message conditional um, in my uh, in my my user interaction class, which is saying, give me a condition, and based on this condition, I'll tell whether I'll write or not. But it keeps it basically means that a conditional um, a conditional right to the user is always kept as basically a single line thing. It's enforcing it. So yeah, I I but I, I wouldn't be too losing too much sleep if you if you left it as the if. But there you go. That's that's doing the same basic thing. And that would look like this. So um, this, this is an example of my functional beginning. So I'll do write union instructions as a user interaction. This is my, uh, my discriminated union. Then switch my discriminated union to determine is it the right type and the value? And then use write mission conditional based on this guy to write or not this block of text where it writes the rules of the game. That's a nice simple example. Another, another concept I wanted to uh, touch on was how I deal with things like managing the inventory. So this is a block at the beginning where we have to get the users to enter their choices for each of the items that you want to populate the inventory of the game. So your oxen team, uh, having more or fewer oxen determines how fast you move somehow. Uh, there's the food, which if you don't keep that topped up, well, you know, you starve. Ammunition for, for fighting uh, riders on the trail or for fighting off bandits or uh, occasionally wolves can attack you, I think, in the game. It's, it's surprisingly detailed, this stuff. Clothing is more for passing the uh, through the mountains. And then it's called miscellaneous supplies. And for whatever reason, that's what they call them in the game. But actually, it's medical supplies is what that really is. You use these whenever you get injured. But the point is that um, there is some validation built in. There's basically a looping system. There's loops within loops within the game. It looks kind of vaguely like this. So given oxen, um, keep basically it keeps looping around again and again and again until you reach a valid state. If it's less than 200, it says not enough. If it's more than 300, it says too much. Anything else, and it will carry on looping around this until you give a value between those. Then we switch on to food. And all that has to be is above zero. And again, it loops until the valid state is reached and so on with ammo, clothes and miscellaneous. Then finally at the end, 
there's another bit that says, have you spent more than 700 $700 as it happens. If you have, then actually loop all the way back to the beginning and do the whole thing again. Now, if, if this were um, a convention object orientated code, then we might do something like this. It's a while true. And then just literally, I could still use is and stuff like this nice funky uh, um, things for checking. So what I can say is, First off, start with a, a get input to say how much do you want to spend on oxen. Do a check that it's an integer and that the uh, check that the range is correct. And if it's great, then just return. Otherwise, we're going to have to decide which user get input we're going to have uh, to send to the user. And uh, basically, it will carry on looping around it again and again and again. But this is not um, functional code. This is this is proced uh, procedural. So. We could rewrite like this. This is one option. This is using standard recursion. Start with a, a standard input and uh, call to get input. And this is again doing the same sort of check. But the difference is that there's a switch in here that says if it's valid, then return. If it's not valid, call this same function again and just keep trying again and again. And again. Now, this is functional now. But it's it's not a great idea necessarily. I mean, in this case, how many times are they going to make? Probably not many. But um, the problem is that if they do make many attempts, if this carries on looping again and again and again and again forever, then it's actually leaving every call to the same function again on the stack. And that number of calls is slowly building on the stack. Now, if the, if there were hundreds of such iterations, you'll have hundreds of instances of this function open on the stack waiting for something finally to return a value and just collapse it down all into a single thing. It's, uh, it's not ideal. It's quite heavy on memory. I have written functional apps this way and eventually it just tends to consume all the memory and explode. So it's not, it's not great, not if you think there's gonna be much iteration. If you're fairly convinced there's not, and it's only a few, then to be honest, this isn't too bad. There's nothing wrong with this. But I used uh, a technique called trampolining, as it happens, though. This seems to be the way forward. Now, this is one of those fuzzy areas I've mentioned. I've written uh, an interface, which is effectively functional, and it's modeled around the idea of uh, recursion. I've called it iterate until. So what I'm saying is iterate until the state I want is reached. And here I'm saying, this is the thing to keep trying. So this is having a bash at whatever it is. And this is the condition after which I will actually want you to terminate. So that is that it's an integer between 200 and 300. And it will keep iterating forever, but it's not actually recursive. It's a while loop. So it's still a while loop. This is a little bit of cheating, gonna be honest, but it's the way it is. F sharp can actually do recursion in such a way that it's not a cheat like this. It literally is recursion and it is optimized in such a way that you don't fill the stack up. So that's fine. And technically that feature is available on the stack, on the uh, intermediate language for us, it exists. But so far as I'm aware, there are no plans whatsoever to introduce it into C sharp. I was at NDC Copenhagen a few weeks ago and I actually had a chat with the, uh, the C sharp team and no, there is no plan. This is probably the best way to implement what they call tail recursion. It's a cheat, but like at least I've hidden it behind this single instance of this, this extension method. So if in the future something better comes up, I'll just literally replace this and the interface will still be met. I have thought about things like exposing bits of F sharp into C sharp, but I'm told that that is just more trouble than it's worth. So sadly, this is basically your best option. And this is how I deal with an awful lot of the rest of the, um, the gets for, for your inventories as well. I mean, the most of the rest of this is, it's literally just a get non-zero. So I created a generic version. The All of the other items in inventory, it's just get less. It just has to be above zero. There's no other uh, validation required. So pretty much the same thing again, get an input, um, iterate until it is what I want. That is an integer with greater than zero. Anything else will result in... Um, in an error, and we'll just carry on doing that until we have exactly what we want, and then return. There's my function for stitching it all together. So what I'm doing is saying, let's. This is this literally is um, 
uh, multiple calls to the same function. So I'm saying keep calling, uh, first off call the oxen and get that one, and then append to that array. Append means actually create a new array based on the old one with the new item at the end, so not modifying state, um, and add in a new item until such time as, uh, I think so as well, there we go. So this is getting the initial inventory. What I'm saying is, and keep iterating around calls to update inventory um, until such time as there are five items in it. And then check the total spend. Now I really have literally used actual recursion here because how many times are they gonna keep going around the entire inventory process? Uh, I, I would get bored and close the game after I'd done that a few times and got it wrong. So I'm assuming there's probably only a few calls. So it means every time there we, we, uh, we can just literally call the same function again and start again. And then finally, when we've actually got a reasonable spend, convert it to a dictionary and then just use the dictionary to create my, my, uh, my inventory object. So there, all the, uh, all the rules are met. And that's actually my engine that I use for, for driving the game. I've created an extension method called continue game. Now, continue game, Again, is hiding away some of the logic that drives the uh, drives the game. Um, what I'm doing is feeding func. These are actually function calls. These guys, each one of these is a function call, and each one of these does the same thing, which is old state to new state. Um, now, the state actually is a record type, so I'm not modifying anything. Every single time, I'm returning a new record based on an old record with some rules applied. And each one of these is doing that same exact thing, but the continued game is running a rule in the background like this. What it's saying is, look at the state. If the game is over or the player is dead, then just return that same state. Otherwise, this function, whatever this function is, execute it. So going back one, what that means is if we got as far as riders on the trail, and at this point we fell afoul of our riders, and uh, the player was shot dead, then the state returned here would be would have is dead is equal to true now. And this continue game would run, but then this one would say, examine the state that came out of this one, notice that they're dead. And so this function would not be executed, nor would this one. And we just come all the way to game over and then check the end game conditions there based on wherever it was they died. Uh, this is a very simple version of a monad. Very simple. I'm keeping it relatively simple here. We can go much deeper into some of this stuff, but uh, that's a different talk. And yeah, I'm doing pretty good. So going into a couple of other areas of the game. See, I had to, I, I spent ages in these drawings. They're not great, but I, damn it, I'm going to show each and every one of them off. But the the shooting mini game. This is how I implemented the shooting mini game. This is so the whole idea in the shooting mini game is you are prompted at various points with uh, an attempt to shoot somebody or something, and you have to type bang b a n g as quickly as possible, and then it returns whatever it was, however long that was taken, up to a maximum of seven. For some reason, seven was considered the maximum, and this was implemented in tons of lines of code in the original version, but I managed to do it in just a couple. So I've got a time service, which is actually just a wrapper around um, a date time dot now. But again, I want this to be entirely 100% testable and it pretty much is. So um, I'm, I'm obscuring that away behind the time service and my player interaction, which is my, my gigantic that elaborate system I showed you at the beginning for, um, for wrapping around interactions with the player. So shoot means Use the time service to uh, the time service to get the current time. Send type bang to the user to do a check against which type it is. So if it was a text input and it was bang, then that means it's a hit. The time taken is equal to was it a hit? If it was a hit, that means they typed bang. Then get the current time again and duck the start time. Then that's how many seconds. Otherwise, seven. So again, seven was always considered to be the maximum. So what it means is if you mistyped bang, then you would, or typed an integer or empty string or whatever, then you get seven, All of this, uh, but if you did everything correctly, then you got the seconds and you can't go more than seven, which again was a rule in the original. It took me ages to explain that, not many Ryan lines of code to write it. It's one of the beauties of functional. So that's the shooting mini game. Surprisingly fun, to be honest. And riders on the trail ahead, Anyone remember Brave Star? Wasn't it awesome? Yeah. 
Um, so riders on the trail ahead, this is a thing that can happen. Uh, and this is a surprisingly complicated block of code, this is. So there are multiple probability checks in the riders on the trail ahead. The first is, are there riders? And that uses this long, complicated um, curve graph. Um, I don't entirely understand it, but it's based on the idea that they wanted it to be more likely to have riders at certain points of the 2000 odd mile trail and less likely others. So they basically plotted a sort of uh, a complex uh, graph out and then use that to determine uh, a value between zero and 10 that would give you your oh, RND here is by the way, another a wrapper for just a, a standard probability object. And again, I've, I've, I've wrapped it around this interface because I want to be able to inject my own values. Um, but they use this for determining whether there are. And then based on that, we either encounter riders or we just return old state to say nothing happened. But then beyond that, there was another series of operations done. So first off, there was a probability check to say, do the riders look friendly? Then following that, there was another check to say, OK, they looked friendly or they didn't, but there was a 0.8 chance that actually they were the other thing. So it was a multi-stage operation. This took me ages of staring at to get it right. And then by following that, you'd be presented with a series of actions, run, attack, continue, and then that involves getting the input. And again, I want to iterate until because I need them to actually put in a valid item, which is an integer between um, one and four. And then there's all my various options. Again, pattern match. This is basically the same style I use throughout the game is um, use validate with, um, with uh, recursion, get myself a, value, a discriminated union back, check its type, and then use pattern matching to determine what on earth to do next. And here's one of the places where we might actually trigger a shooting match uh, or not, depending on what you did. And the rest of it is just things like, based on what they decided to do and whether the riders were friendly, it determines what's the new mileage, there was a, a difference in how much food was consumed, uh, stuff like that. Or in some cases, just nothing, nothing happened. And then I'll give some conditionals after here based on whether the riders were friendly or not to give some feedback to the users on what to do. And then finally a check, because if you ran out of ammunition, then we had to take them dead. Because if you run out of ammo, sorry chaps, you didn't make it this far and then return out that final updated state and carry on the game. There are, I'm gonna, hey, 42 minutes, that's good. I did time that well. Okay, so there's a few things left on my to-do list, which um, I would love to have done. And some of them, I'm not quite even sure if I can achieve. This is a bit of basic. So if you see here, there's these funny little characters here, these sort of odd things with this apostrophe seven. What that did is, now, when it was printing to the teletype, it was literally writing a character at a time. And apostrophe seven was a special case that meant actually ring a little bell. So what I would type is finally a right ding at or a ding gun like that. I don't even know if you can do that in, uh, in the console. I've got no idea. But um, I, I might look into that. But I don't know if I've, for the time being, I've just literally taken these special characters out and just literally written this message. Uh, I don't know whether I can. Could anyone know if you can do a ding in the console? I would love it if you could, but that might have to wait. Uh, but other than that, though, that's, that's what victory condition looks like. Hooray. Um, I'd, I'd like to carry on doing some of these things. Now, one of the ones I want to move on to is there was a Doctor Who game released in the 1970s, a text adventure called Doctor Who and the Warlord. I have never played this thing. This is going to be a lot harder because the game was so massive, it was actually more memory than the computers of the time had. OK, there's someone says emit slash B to the console. Thank you. I shall have a look at that. Um, this game was so big that they had to release it as basically a series of, of compressed data. And the first thing the game does is uncompress itself and then execute. So I have got the source code to this. It's floating around on the, on the internet. It was released to the BBC Micro, but it's absolutely unreadable because first you've got to work out how to uncompress it. But I am a massive fan of Doctor Who, so I am not going to let this challenge left un undone. So that might be my next one to try and work out how on earth to decode Doctor Who and the Warlord, because it's a game that's pretty much been left uh, 
um, completely forgotten since the early 80s. I think it was actually created by at a time, by the way, when they were changing from one doctor to another, which is why there's no picture of Peter Davison on the front. Okay, that's the last of me talking about this game for now. But um, if anyone is interested, I have a book coming out on functional programming with C Sharp. Um, so feel free to, to scan this barcode. Uh, I'm writing this book for O'Reilly and O'Reilly provided me this barcode so that you can go ahead and uh, get yourself a free trial for a month on their, on their platform. If anyone would like to read this book and provide some feedback, it's always, I'm always grateful. Steve, I know you provided an awful lot. Steve was, yeah, thank you. Steve was awesome and provided me with the level of feedback like no one else on this earth. So thank you for that. Um, but if anyone at any time wants to, uh, to help out, do please, because I really want it to be good. Um, and it's, it's, it's about, it's nearly half done now. <laughs>